All right, I want to welcome everybody to the Parrot Club's April 2023 meeting. We have Sheila Blanchett with us. Sheila is the owner of Heart of Feathers Education and Behavior Training, and she works towards creating a unique designed one-on-one -on -one session and a personal training plan for you and your bird. She's the Professional International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, Certified Parrot Behavior Consultant Trainer. She completed and received her Fear Free Veterinary Avian Certification Program from Fear Free Pets and her certification from the University of Washington in Applied Animal Behavior. She volunteers at local rescues and may foster companion birds with undesired behavior. She passes her professional knowledge and experience to her clients. She's actually uh, working on a chapter for a book right now, she told me, and she recently uh, completed a certification for a end-of-life doula for pets. I don't know much about that, but I'm hoping in the future we'll hear more about that because that, that sounds fascinating. Uh, Sheila is a frequent speaker to our club. We've seen her many times over the years, so we're extremely happy to have her back to, to give us another one of her tremendous talks. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Sheila. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to this. Uh, we're going to be talking about Target Training 101, one of my favorite, favorite topics. But I want to, first of all, thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Amy, for inviting me. I love her bird club, by the way, and I do miss some of the in-person stuff. But maybe another year, right, Amy? So I will get going. Um, again. For anybody who might have joined if that's on this live session, you're welcome to either let Amy know through the chat if you have any questions along the way, and Amy will let me know so I can, I'll stop and try to answer them. I, I'm tr I'll try not to make this too long. But we're going to go over the importance of why, why target training is important. I like to go over a couple of terms before I get into training. And then we'll do, I'll show you some starting steps, putting it together, and then how to even develop it further. And, and hopefully it's a little fun along the way, I guarantee, but we'll see. I I love target training. I think it's really important for a, any companion bird to, to learn about it. It's not about tricks, because a lot of people think, oh, target training is about spinning and racing, but it does lead to other wonderful training. It also helped because I have worked with birds that are hand hand shy. I'm going to call it that, um, or you know, have some mistrust to people. So doing target training is very off contact. Your hands are not always involved, and this is a great way to kind of get started. And again, I've used this for birds that had a history of attacking cage bars or flying at people you know, or being able to teach stationing. So this does come in handy. Again, I've take, taken courses on, you know, learning about veterinarian care and target training helps all of us prep for those vet exams, you know, medicine, you know, putting medicine in a syringe and doing syringe training. You know, target training in and out of a crate, maybe even stepping up on a scale using target training. So again, all really good. I like it for redirect training, um, and we'll see what I'll, I'll explain further as we go along. And I, I believe it builds confidence and trust with the birds um, doing target training. All right. Well, let me go over a couple of terms. And I, some of you may already know these terms, um, but I, you know, I like just double checking, right? And my big one is about positive reinforcement. Um, I'm not going to talk about the other quadrant, but just it's just adding something immediately following a behavior to increase or maintain the future strength of that behavior. And that's why we like positive reinforcement. It encourages new trainable, you know, opportunities. The bird though selects the reinforcer, meaning the thing that is going to increase that. It builds trust. And I, with it, you can, you can, you know, progress can be tracked. You can see if it is increasing or maintaining. There is a fallout with it. Um, you can accidentally reinforce the wrong behavior. And if anybody has contacted me about vocalization, we've discussed that. Um, you make the steps too big. You're oversaturating with too many reinforcers. So I'm going to show you. Let's see if my, I, got, I hope my videos work. All right. 
Um, and I'm sorry what I look like in this picture, right? But this is, my bird in here is Toque. This is Toque. And you'll see what, he, what I'm reinforcing. Right. And, and so, and so I just wanted to show you his reinforcement was just, was praise. That was his, pop, you know, I was adding it after and it encouraged him to maintain that roll over. What you don't see later on is we, we did get to drop, drop and roll. I was practicing for one of those fire things so he could drop and roll. Let's see if I can move to the next one. So we need to take that because this, these terms are important when we start to get in target training. There's counter conditioning, which is introducing a new object. Now, I, I don't know if this video will help. I won't go into this a lot deeper, but so this beautiful sun climber liked to grab objects. You would grab, toss them, throw them. And we, what we wanted to do was just have him touch it, just touch the ring, not get grabby. And so that's what we were practicing on. We started from a distance and reinforced just perceive, just seeing it and not jumping at it or grabbing it, just acknowledging that good things happen when the ring comes. And then we, we got, and you can see he started to look for it. And then, um, so this is just, we're just changing the emotion of, of not grabbing the object. So we're countering the conditioning it. And again, this, this helps with some of the, if anybody, had, when we get down to target training, we use a little of this for some birds who are neophobic to objects, right? And seeing if we, you know, we don't flood them throwing these sticks in front of them, right? Um, and part of that, again, I'm gonna show you this video. I don't mean to jump around. I just wanna get a few of these, these terms in here because I use them throughout the, some of the training. Um, these are two Conyers and I'm doing target training, I'm doing a target training demo with birds I don't know about target training. And what I want you to watch is when I show the stick, one comes forward and yeah, the other one is not too too excited about that, that um, stick. So I've got to go back and try to work, go back and work with this one, right? Because he backed away versus coming forward and interacting. So he, I don't know, I didn't know much about these climbers when I was working with them. I, um, this is what happens when you're you're doing um, vendor events and people just bring your bird and say, oh, teach them something. And I don't have a lot of background um, with them. So I was trying to systematically work with each one without, without flooding them or going two bigger steps. And the one that backed off, I backed off of and we approached it a little differently. And that's what, you know, I want to be able to do is have that other conure look forward and seeing the target stick versus backing away from the target stick. So I just wanted to mention, you know, these terms because when we get into target training, all of these tie together into what I like doing is shaping. I like shaping behaviors. I just feel like shaping is another way of training where we're taking a final goal and breaking it up into smaller steps and having these successes happen on each step. And that's when we get into target training, you're going to see this because I'm, I, I just like doing it in these small steps. And I have an example here. It's not a great one, but you know, when we're teaching our birds how to do something, we're always jumping to the end goal really fast without thinking about each little step. And one of the, if I take it into a little more adult, like going to the gym, right? And every, if anybody's ever gone to the gym, I go to the gym. You think, okay, I just go to the gym. But really, there's a lot of steps in there. And anything could go wrong to change your mind from going to the gym. And you still need those successes, right? So, you know, and I joke, okay, I'm going to go get my car keys to go to the gym. I look outside, it's raining. I could go, eh, I don't want to go to the gym now. Like, I could just make this decision. So then I'm not, you know, so how do I, you know, become successful, you know, of, you know, I can't even get past the first step. Now, maybe I put a hundred dollar bill next to my car key. So that I go, oh, hi, yeah, I've got the car keys. Now I got to get into the car. I, 
the same thing you get. Okay, I can get the car keys. I, I can get myself downstairs into the car and maybe drive to the gym. But if there's rope construction, am I going to go? I may say, okay, I'll go around it. Or am I go, oh, nope, I'm not going to do it today. So like there are all these little steps that we don't think about when we're going, when we're doing something. Right? Because we process it when we either we have our, you know, we have our own reinforcers that say, you know, why we keep going to the next step. But there's always these little things that back us up and we, you know, but I always, if I don't go that day, I say, okay, well, tomorrow I'm going to try again. I'll try again tomorrow and I, I will be a little more upbeat. Maybe it'll be sunny tomorrow. Maybe there won't be any other structure. Maybe I'll go in the parking lots, not full, right? So this is why I'm bringing this up and it sounds silly is that's how we have to look at when I look at target training, right? And we'll get into it is one, before we start, we have to know our individual birth and what can I do to encourage these little steps? What is, you know, what is this bird really like? And as you saw my bird too, he loves attention. Oh, he eats it up. But other birds may not. Some have those favorite foods um, of things that are, you know, nice and healthy and maybe not so healthy. Maybe they like scratches, you know, or access to a toy. So before we start, we need to really identify those because we're going to use those. What are we using as the target? Because again, I don't want to use something too big and scare the bird. And I don't want it too little that the bird doesn't know what I'm what I'm doing. So, you know, so you can get, you know, there are professional target sticks. I like chopsticks myself. Um, the third thing, you could use the palm of your hand, your finger. Again, if I have a bird who I might have a behavior of biting, I might not use my hand. Um, there are birds that I've worked with that are, you know, more domesticated, meaning chickens, and I've done button quails and other things where I use discs instead of a target stick. So I move them around that way. So again, it, what you're trying to accomplish, what time are we going to do the target training? Again, it doesn't always have to be exact. Um, but if you know your bird is a little more motivated in the morning, that's a great time to do training. You do, but you also should be in the mood. If you're not in the mood, you're not going to train. Um, and then where are we doing the training? Is the bird in the cage, on the cage, top of the cage, on the perch? You know, And wherever you pick to do this training, we're going to be consistent. But then when we do target training, the bird may move and you are going to have to kind of start over again. And it, But it'll move quickly. But this is why it's important to kind of pick these things to start consistent, and then you can start to adjust. Okay. Now, the other part is the mechanism. Um, now, this is a little bit of an obnoxious video, but it's there for a reason. Is when you have when you're doing the the target stick to the thing. I'm always about. I need to know where my bird is the most comfortable of me showing it. So I'm. I always tell people to back up you know, five feet, six feet, and they laugh at me because they're like, well, does the bird see? Oh yeah, the bird sees it. Now, in this video, I'm going to show you my motion. Yes, I have a huge target stick, but it was just for the video so you could see. <laughs> it isn't, all right, and I know the sound is on, I should, but it's just me moving the target stick and I'm watching my bird, to, and there is a bird in there watching me, but I'm making sure that I'm not scaring my bird with it, but I'm being very slow. Now, that stick is really big. But again, it was just so you could see the motion in this video. Um, usually I use smaller sticks, but again, it was more to showing you the motion. Now, at any point, if I started to move that stick and the bird was uncomfortable, I'd stop. I would stop and reset and either make the, the stick smaller. I would slow down and maybe maybe I only move, maybe only move it from my leg a little bit. And as long as they're comfortable, then I call it okay. But that's the preparation. Once you got, you got to get the mechanism set, um, right? And then, see, back to those words I was using before: shaping and desensitizing, right? And this is where I do have people I talk to who say, "Well, I put the target stick, I moved it, but the bird was very nervous, or the bird bit the stick, or 
they, they don't like the stick. I use it. <clears throat> and I ask, well, where, you know, I'll have, this is where I say, step, keep stepping back, backwards, until you get to a place where you see what I call, now I'm going to define calm behavior, right? Um, every bird's a little different. But when I'm talking about calm behavior, the bird is not squawking. Feathers aren't ruffled up. They're not, they might move a little, but not in this pacing or around the cage, or maybe they're trying to get out of the cage because you, you want to back up enough that it almost is like they don't see it. It's there, you know, they, they know it's there. But that what you want is them almost looking and going, uh, uh, okay, and not caring. That's where you, that's where I like to start. Some people like to start a little closer and that's fair. I like to start at the point. Because again, I like shaping. I want the bird to see me five feet away. I, I move this target stick, whatever, chopstick. I, you know, move it up, back down. And I say good, or I give a thumbs up. That, and then I will put, I will put, I will come over, put the stick down. And then I will give the bird whatever reinforcer they want for just having that, what I'm defining as calm behavior. And then I only move forward, you know, the next step. When I got, I like to do a couple of repetitions. <clears throat> they don't have to be the same. They don't have to be within the same moment. You could try the next day. You know, again, it's all on your schedule. I try to do two when I know the bird's interested and I might do two later. And I only move forward if I feel when I'm looking at the bird, I will try to move a step forward. And before I even move the stick, I'll move forward. And as long as, again, I see calm behavior, I'll try it the next, you know, four feet away. It's up to the bird. It is enough to me. It's up to the bird. And if I get stuck, I stay at four feet for a while, right? And I just show the stick. And you just keep, again, all I'm doing is shaping this. I haven't even said, I don't say touch. I don't say anything. I'm just showing all I want. And I can't do this really well. So bear with me, is the bird goes, okay, she shows this thing and I get touch, I get a yummy item, oh, I get to, I get to play with my favorite toy, okay, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to build, this trust that between, you know, the, the object, myself and the bird. So this is Sunny, who is at a rescue, who I was um, working with, and I'm probably I don't know, maybe two feet away. This bird doesn't know me. And I show the stick. Sorry, I'm holding a camera and doing this at the same time. So they're, you know, but I'm just looking for just nice, calm behavior. And then I just work in that. That's all I'm looking at. In this one, I'm a little closer. You're going to have to look over at the far by the palm tree to see the, the target stick show up. Hey. Okay. It shows up, it goes away. The bird looked, it's hard to see. Fluffy just sees it. And then a yummy, yummy little sunflower seed comes over. So I'm always, when I'm doing this training, I'm always watching their behavior. So I don't push, I don't rush. I slow my pace down. Um, and that's what I have to watch because I have one bird who's very good at target training and I have another bird who's not so good at target training and I have to watch my pace sometimes when I'm working with the one not because I'm so used to one who loves to target train. The, the next part this is where we're getting closer right so now now you go okay you know, I, all right I get where you're going is now you got to get the stick close right you're, you're moving and so the feet start to become inches. Now you're moving. And depending on the bird, right? Um, if I know the bird has a history of grabbing objects, grabbing, I may, when I'm getting close, I have, I'm not crossing the cage bars. I'm just coming close to the cage bars. I'll try to have it, the target stick point up so the bird has to use their beak to hit it, right? Um, because I want the success. So if I come in now, if I see if I'm coming in and the beak goes up like this, I'm coming in too fast and I know I have to back up a step. 
<laughs> so that's what I'm working on when I'm getting closer and closer to the cage. I'm watching the bird's behavior and if they're interested. Now, I could be coming up to the, the cage bars. I'm using a bird who's in the cage and just coming forward with the stick and the bird's sitting there going, okay, and has no interest. That's all right. I'm okay with that. Um, I want the bird to ha have int at some point, you know, as long as I just keep doing it and introducing, I could even at some Again, bring it a little closer, but I, I want the bird to choose to interact with me and the target stick. So that's why some of these steps you see, you, there's, if something, if I move too fast or something goes awry, I always go back a step and say, okay, I'm gonna stay at this step for a little bit longer. If I have to back up again, I back up again. Because sometimes, oops, as I say, oopsies happen, right? You're getting really excited, you're getting close. You're like, oh, I'm right there. I'm just going to push just a little and something, you know, something, the bird goes up, stop, backs up, goes up, up, and you go, okay. you just back up a step and you stay there for a little while and build the confidence back. So that's why sort of you'll see in some of my notes, you'll see stop and go, because I want you to observe and stop when you're, if you're pushing, stop, reset yourself, back up a step and try or end the session. You know, there's, it's okay if it's like, eh, I need to back up. I need to reset myself as well. So this is Hey Hey. Um, he, can't, he, he can't fly, but um, this was my first, well, probably my second attempt at trying to target train him. He's, um, and so I'm showing a little, the stick will show up, you'll see it. Um, but I'm just staying a little distance. And his, he likes head scratches. That's his big, his big thing. And so he moved a little. So I took, I every little step closer I take. All right. So I just wanted to show you how these little, just these tiny little steps, I'm letting him move at his pace. Right. I don't push it. I try to be very careful. And I'll stay at a step. So that's why it's important to watch your bird when you're doing target training and not, you know, and watch your own pace and your own steps moving forward. In this one, I'll give you, a, this is an example where I, if you watch, there's my little target stick and the, and Zoe moved away. Like, nope, I have no interest. In, I move, I move too fast um, in that. So I, I would, for this one, I ended up backing up a couple of steps. But I wanted to show you, uh, again, how he's right there and he, nope, not, you know, I, I did the, you know, my process of how I approached, how I showed the stick, he backed up. So I respect it and I will, I'll do it again. I'll try a different approach. Back to, back to Fluffy. Fluffy was great. Um, this was a bird I had in Foster and um, Foster. Um, so that I was target training Fluffy and he's in the, you know, he's in the middle of doing something and I'm showing a target stick. So I'll show it once and then I'll try one more time. And if there's no interest, like there's no, he's not looking at it. There's, he has no interest to be involved in this. I just end the session. I don't even give, I don't give, I don't say anything. I don't give anything. I just end the session. Um, and then I'll come back later. Now later is up to your bird. It could be an hour later. It could be the next day. Um, for me, like I'll try in the morning and then I'll try closer to evening. I try when they're in, when they're eating, when they're thinking about food. And um, offer it again. Nope, you know, in this one, I, I'm trying to get a little closer just to see, because I wanted a success. So that's why I went in a little bit. He didn't have to touch it. I just wanted to make sure he didn't move and he was he was still interested in, the, in it. But again, watching behavior. Oops. Um, so that way, I know I went over a lot of little steps, but I want to show you what putting it together is like, but um, this other video I wanted to show you is, is target training, but with the, with the pigeon, where we started to use a target, this time it was a target of just 
All the bird had to do was touch. So he's still touching the target. It's just a poker chip instead. So we moved from using a target stick to a disc. It was the same approach. We still had to kind of adjust for it, but it's the same thing. So again, when we get close enough, when we're getting to that close with a target stick and the bird are really near each other, this is where you start putting it all together. It start now you've got your you're almost at you're almost in the door of the gym, right? You're just right there. Um, and what you're hoping is the bird wants to reach to it. You know that there's this now there's some interest because there's this 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 stick has some value to it. And I try not I try in the ones you were saw, I Buffy and I had some trust so I could open the doors. But on birds where I'm still working with that trust. When the targets, I try not to have the targets just cross the, the cage bars. I want the beak to come out a little bit. Um, just, you know, so I can see what I have a better seeing. I, if I put the target stick through the cage bar to the bird, the bird has an opportunity to grab it. Now, if they grab it, I just let go. I have, um, I have a gazillion chopsticks. If they want to chew that one, that's fine. I just remember the next time not to do that. So that's why I always, my approach is again to have it outside and ha and just enough that they have to reach and their their beak just touches it and it's okay i'm okay if they i guess the word is beak it where they just nibble on it i just don't want them to grab it and take it from me and again it does when you're doing it that sometimes happens i just tell people like oh the target stick they'll drop it at some point or they'll chew it and you just get, grab another one that's again why i like chopsticks you know, when you when you get chopsticks, there's two. So you always have a spare. Okay. And that's just how we're shaping it until we get to that point. And when they start to to, to be a little more consistent, then as I as I start to show it, I'll say I will then put the word touch if I want to. Um so that that I can start to get, not lead as much. I can start to just you know, say touch, show the stick, and they're already in the motion of it because I've already started really shaping these together. So again, my favorite, fluffy. Um, and it's just, it's just in a little bit, you know. I'm not really worried that he's going to take it away, but I wanted you to be able to just, it's much easier in that video to see I'm touching it. Right. And I wanted to have a little fun with you on this video, back to the pigeon. You can see the red disc way out in the far part of the thing. And let's see this video, there he goes. And he, he targets it, in the, meaning he touches it, he comes back. Um, so I wanted to show both sides of targeting of, you can use a target stick, you can also use a target object. To use it i just we were working with this pigeon and you could see um the client i had would put this target object anywhere and then the pigeon would go down touch it and then go back for it, which was great i um would go back and get it so this can be done with pigeons and chickens and so on so i just wanted to show both sides of this And so I, I know I went fast and it's just, I wanted to give you an idea of target training. I um, I try to write up the documents for people so I can send them out to you. And it is, it's step by step by step. Um, but once you really put the shaping tools together and you're putting positive reinforcement on the stick and you're doing all these great things together with your bird, then you can have a little fun, right? And say spin and then have them touch the target stick and eat the yummy millet or whatever they would like. So it does begin, that's with where the next things start. And I don't know if you can see this one or not. Um, and again, this one's a fluffy, um, it's a great little leopard. But I've just put food in there. This is, I also got fluffy in the cage um, at night. 
but I was curious at the time if he if he would go in or if he was more interested in target training. And so you can see I kind of moved too fast on the target on this side. So I wanted to show you what happens when, you know, and then I put in the right place. And then he got his, he's everything. So he was choosing target training over there's a whole bunch of food in that container that went into his. Um, so it's interesting once I've got that target training together and working, how the bird will work for food. There was food in that container. If he, if he wanted it, he could add it. Um, and then he decides he'll go into his cage. Right. And this is, again, where I, I wanted to show you how, because people again ask me, they go, okay, so I get target training. What's it, what are some of the uses for it? In this one, this is Jack. And Jack liked, he was really on the, on my goal to try to eat my wood frames of my window. That was kind of his goal in life when he was visiting me. But we had worked really hard with target training. And that, I, so I could redirect him to not eat my wood frame and he could have- Number four is follow through. <laughs> you like that? So, so it became fluency. So this, all of this training is really just fluency once we get through it all. All right. And I, I don't have, I, I had, this was a slide that was extra. I don't have to do all this, but it can lead. I, I go from target training to syringe training. It's all the exact, the same process. So you can do syringe training. Um, I'll skip all this stuff. Um, Cause I don't think anybody wants to really see. I'm going to pass this, but, and this is one last thing. And then I, I this was again, they, um, getting a pigeon to go into a crate using the target. Right. And my last one, last video, um, again, this is Hey Hey, and I'm asking him if he wants to target train. You can hear some of the birds in my background of this video. And this is him coming down for target training. You can hear the Quaker in the background if you hear anything. But I thought you'd get a kick out of this is this is just. Hey, hey, doesn't like um, he is nervous with hands, so that's why we have a lot of ladders. We use ladders for him. All right. So I went a little fast, but I wanted to show you um, the world of target training. And it, you know, it takes a little time, but it does, you know, with fluency and putting it all together, it, it really does um, have, a, it offers so much. All right, uh, Amy, I'll, I'll end my, my slide. Like I said, I didn't want to go on and on about this. Okay, wonderful. Uh I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. Anybody who wants to unmute or put questions in the uh, chat, Ruth Ann says a good way to give your bird exercise, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I've always been a little confused about the clicker. So is it correct that, is my understanding correct that the clicker oh, saying, saying like good job or good, those are the same thing. So you could click when they do the right thing or you could say good bird or something, that that's basically... The right. same thing? Yeah, it's a marker. So the clicker is a marker. Good. So you're just, that's the behavior I want. Good. And Amy, you bring up a good thing, a good, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask this, I'm going to tell this question. So some of our birds, right, um, could have, could be deaf, right? They could be going, cataracts going blind. There are different things. So I do like to, clickers are good, bells are good, right? So if you have a bird who might be getting cataracts or not seeing well and you wanted to do target training, you could use the bell, and, you know, versus good. But the bell, you know, will be closer to the tar the stick so that the bird starts to learn where to direct its mm -hmm. beak. Um, 
if they're going deaf or have something. That's why I like doing the thumbs up so they have a visual, those who might have a visual cue. So the clicker is good. I just, I'm going to admit this. Cassie can jump in at a time. I'm not very good at holding the target stick and the clicker at the same time. I'm just not coordinated enough. Um, and some clickers are loud. Some of my birds are not, don't like that loud clicker. I have soft ones, but I always have my mouth with me. So that's what, that I'm aware of it's with me. <laughs> so that's why I do good or, you know, good job um, because I can catch it at the moment I see it. Now, I'm sometimes I'm off and trust me, my birds tell me when I'm off, they, they let me know when I, I did not mark the right situation. But most times, you know, I'll catch it. Um, so that that's a good question. And again, I have nothing against the clicker. And people who do clicker training, I love them for it. Because, you know, that coordination of being able to click it right at that marker. Now, those who use clickers, and Cassie's probably one of those excellent people, um, is once you've clicked it, that is the mark of the behavior. Anything that happens afterwards, you ignore it, right? So if you you clicked, maybe they they touched it, but then they grabbed it after you clicked. It's still giving the you, you you know what you already clicked, you know. So that's the important part of those things is marking the behavior. Um, okay, so that I guess that always had me confused. So people don't have to go buy a clicker, and you know most people have chopsticks because if you eat at any Asian restaurant or you do takeout. They always give you chopsticks, so you really don't need anything else. Right. Again, again, if you're, uh, again, I'm not going to, uh, clickers are great. I'm not going to, you know, say anti, I, you know, it's a great thing. And in some, I will tell you, there's some birds, but, you know, it may be you have multiple birds, right? And you, you know, clicking, you might need that. So that target stick, you saw me with that huge, long target stick. I had two birds that had cages on opposite sides of the rooms because I was doing stationing and targeting. And so I would be reaching over for, as one was eating who did good, right? I'd be doing this and I'd have the clicker on the other hand and I'd reach over and the other one would touch and I'd click and then I'd switch. So one bird was being fed, but the other bird, because I couldn't always say good because I'm like watching both. So that's what the only time I had the clicker in my hand was doing these two, doing this back and forth. And so the bird who heard the click knew the food was coming. Have you ever done two birds at the same time? Like, especially like a couple love birds, a couple of cockatiels. They're both on the table. They tend to hang together. Have you ever tried just, you know, both of them responding and getting? You know? Again, if you if you're, it's how coordinated you are. I <laughs> I liked having them on opposite cages and having this long target stick because it was. Eat, I was in the middle and I I had enough arm length that I could. One was touching while the other I was feeding the other, and then I could swap. Um, but you're right, when you have two cockatiels or two lovebirds, or I'm going to do two green tea conyers who are fighting over the same food item, right? And you're trying to, you, you, so you need the target stick to sort of say, you over here, you over there, <laughs> and you do it. Um, so I've had people where I say, put food and, you know, with the target stick so that when they touch, you're just sort of, you become a Pez dispenser and you're just doing it so you can keep them from fighting, you know, because they are, they're going to be like, well, what's he got? Yeah. <laughs> And it can be hard because if, you know, a lot of times, especially with cocktails, which I have most experience with, a lot of times you have a pair, you have two of them that are always by their side. So you can't remove one to do training because they they go hysterical if they're separated. So I was just wondering if you have, if you had ever done two at a time. Um, yeah, I have. And it's not easy. And I've had, <laughs> and I've had people, and that's a, it, it's not, and you, you, but it's, it's a great train. Anybody who has two birds, it's a great training method for yourself. Because one, you got to have patience because you're like, okay, I got to figure out how to work with these two and treat them equal, right? They're both equal. And so it's, you know, um, so sometimes you, like I said, you end up having food in both palms and two target sticks and you're just doing it and you're sort of thumbing them out, you know, to keep up. and then you're slowly moving them apart. Not apart like hundreds of miles just enough that you can now start to move one you know do like I was doing feed click feed click right until you can get them to find their own spot right um, uh, so Dawn says love the used to get bird into a carrier 
that pigeon, I think he would do anything to, to get find that little red disc. I, I thought that I thought the disc was a great idea. And yeah. you said you can get him into a cage, get him into a carrier, get him out. He's just he's gonna find that disc. And you know, pigeons are so smart too. So uh, yeah, we the the client who had that one who's allowing me to share these videos, um just for everybody to know, originally this it was a it was a homing pit or a racing pigeon that was found you know when she adopted it because she felt bad and you know she was doing all the right things but this bird didn't have a job right so anybody who came into their house he would peck at people's feet right just just which is and so we needed to find him a job and our the job was to find this red you know we started with just touching the red disc and then we just move it and we just kept moving it and this pigeon just loved it like that was it that was his job you know to find this this red disc and she just ran with it after that we and that's why she wanted to show that was why the crate training was great because she goes no she goes I didn't she didn't have that much trouble getting him in the crate because like you know she could pick him up and put him in but having him choose to go in was a totally different scenario for her right just to have the bird just choose to go in and stay there and when you have these these food items they really love that's what she held on to she didn't it wasn't in his food it wasn't any it was only during training that this bird got this particular food item and i think it was um safflower seeds um that that pigeon loved but she the only thing was she we had to keep changing the Tupperware item because the bird, the pigeon knew in the cabinet which Tupperware had the safflower seeds in it. So when it came out, the bird was already like in position, even though she might've been just moving it. So she had to keep changing the the, the container because that's how smart it is. So not to digress, but you can see how quick they are. Oh yeah. So Ruth Ann says, if you use a target with a blue tip, must you always have the same looking target or can you train the bird to respond to various targets you can change you can you can change it up um you just you may have to start over a little bit right because again you're introducing something new but if you start with a blue tip and then you go to a red tip that's fine um it's again the bird may not know when you do it if you go if you you say oh with the blue tip he touches it all the time right i always tell people when you're introducing a new one just back up a little bit back up a couple of steps to make sure the you know because again new context right new situation start over it'll be faster though because once the bird goes oh we're playing that game okay great um then you can do it um some people again who have different birds will have i like i'm just using this different sticks with different colors for each bird Mm -hmm. Great um, idea. Uh, Ruthann also says it seems like it might be beneficial to have an item that the bird must travel to touch. Yeah, you get there. You'll get. I always start like like you were all doing, you know, nearby, and then you start to have them come. I guess the target. You guys are thinking exactly right. Target training just blossoms into so many other opportunities and stuff, and that's why Jay, who you saw in there. Who really wanted to eat my windowsill? Uh, you know, doing that target and redirecting him, but it was something fun for him. Now, you know, you'd say, "Well, isn't it every time he goes, you're gonna?" Yeah, but then I just smart of me. I just start moving the. I just moved the cage. I just didn't notice it until you know later on. But of course, that makes me wonder how you stop it. Like looking at that pigeon, that pigeon is going to get that red disc. <laughs> So after you've done that for like a half hour, you're like, okay, I want to go do something else. But the pigeon, because if the pigeon's getting fed every time, the pigeon likes the food, what's going to make the pigeon want to stop? Because then you go, okay, I'm done. And the pigeon's like, no, I want that red disc so I can get more food. And yeah, she mostly hides. She just pockets it somewhere. And yeah. it, I don't think she gives an end of thing. I think she just pockets it. And she she has a room. He, he has this whole, this pigeon has this this pigeon does not realize it's got like the life of a pigeon like a, he's he's got a whole room and so she um will put him in the room um 
with some other stuff to do. So he has other enrichment and stuff. So it keeps him keeps him busy. But you're right. There, and there's good and bad with Target, right? Because you're going to find you're going to do this. And that's what I was going to say. Some of my birds are like, yay, we're Target training. And they're like, they get, you know, not over threshold. They just get into the rhythm of, oh, we're training, we're training, we're training. And then at some point you're like, okay, I've got to stop. <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm done. Um, so, you know, for me, I do do an end signal. Like, I'm out um, to say, but that's just me. I don't know if some other trainers give end signals. I just say, okay, we're all done. And then I give them something else to do. Or I try to do one big, you know, let's try, I try something a little new and, you know, sort of try to shape it so it's something new and then end the session. Um, do your birds recognize the end signal? Some, oh, well, yeah. Usually, I don't think I even have to do this anymore. I think as soon as I'm like starting to pack up, I think they figured it out. I still do this, but I honestly, I think they know by me putting in the target stick in my back pocket. I think they they go, okay. I remember they, growing up when we had dogs, you know, they were and dogs, of course, were always trying to get food from my mother. And but she would just say, all done. And they were like, oh, okay, we're all done. They really learned what all done meant and that. They were not going to get anything more after she said all done. Uh, I mean, I, um, but again, I, I, it's an interesting concept. And again, I think there's different research of whether an end signal really means it or the bird gets full and says, I'm done. Because that's the other part is you, you might, you might find with your target training, you get three and the bird goes, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> and you're like, I, I, I just, yeah, I'm done. Birds, birds get birds get full. I'm 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 not. Uh, I'm not. You're not privileged to that. Oh, I'm not familiar with this concept. What does that even mean? <laughs> oh yeah, I am. I am. Tell that tell that to my cockatiel pepper. He he, he would oh. always find room for more food. There's a, there's no concept such as. Oh, uh, well, I have a couple of birds who are like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. And Ruthann um, says, "Have you done target training with a blue and gold macaw? What reinforcement did the bird prefer?" I have not done it. I know other people have done with it. Um, I just haven't, just it hasn't come up as a client yet of anything. I, and again, it all depends on that particular blue and gold or any birds. What is their, you know, do they want scratches? Do they want that? Sorry. Cassie, yeah, I'm sorry I'm going to say this. Just, you know, do they want a slice of pizza? Like what, you know, what is their you know, what is their real big reinforcer of, of, you know, and that's what I would say, or cut up into smaller, smaller pieces for, for training. So apple, I'm just being funny with pizza, but, you know, whatever the apples are, um, or if it's something in their food, they like, pel you know, they like the green pellets over the red pellets. I'm just making up stuff, right? You know, any of those things, that's what I would take out of their food that day, right? Maybe have one in there and then the rest hold for training. And then when you're doing it, that's what you use so they get that big yummy item. That's I mean, my, my cockatoo, there's no stronger reinforcement than a head rub. There, yeah. there is no food on this planet that she would take rather than get a head rub. And that's, I think that I, touch is great. Tactile, yeah. you know. I mean, of course cockatoos cockatiels all that they're you know their big thing is touch and tactile so um, i was so cute with hey hey loving his little every time yeah. he, did, he got a head rub yeah. yeah and hey um is not he he is not very happy with hands and it took a little while for us to just get touch but yeah. he's now like the scratch monster right like no, if you offer it, if you offer the hand, no, but if you do the, we, we, we cue, we cue, you want to scratch? And he's like, ping, like the head just goes, right. So oh that's what Cassie <laughs> says, no need to apologize. <laughs> um, oh, but, Dawn wants to know, how do you give a reward to a bird that bites? That's a I good question. It's a, it's a good question. It's a very good question. I put it in the bowl, right? So I just, hang on, me. hang on, folks, you get to have fun, you get to. I don't know if any anybody of you has ever seen Perfect Bird. This is Perfect Bird. Um, <laughs> perfect Bird. Okay. So if I have again cage bars, you have to imagine cage bars here. If 
and I've worked with bird. That's the birds I mostly work with are birds who are very assertive to the cage bars. That's my word I'm going to use. Um, and I will do target training and I might start from a distance and they're sitting on it and they know I'm coming, right? They, because we've done this enough times, they know I'm coming. So I make sure that there's a food, there's a food bowl a little bit distance from them. So it's not near them, it's a little bit over. So I just go over and I just draw, I don't, I never cross my fingers through the cage bar. I drop it down into the bowl and then they can have it. Now they may choose not to take it, right? Cause we've done the session. They're looking at me going, okay. Right, and I put the sunflower seed or the safflower in the millet in the bowl, and I'll do another session. And what's interesting is, I'm joking. I have no idea what they're thinking. I'm joking. I think they're doing a little bank. They're like, yeah, I need one more. I need one more. I need five sunflower seeds. You've only put four in there, okay? <laughs> you know, because it seems like they'll. They're not. They're fine. They're not doing anything. But I always, you know, and I'll put something in their food bowl. And there's just this moment where they go, yep, that's five. Okay. And they go over and they go eat what's in there, right? Like they, they're, oh, again, I don't know what they're thinking. I have no idea. It might be they're done. I don't know. But it just, it, when I'm doing them from there. But what's interesting is after a while, um, they, when you do this training with birds who have kind of this sort of decay things, I like, I always like putting it in the bowl anyway, right, versus handing, because I've got to pick up who's got the blue and gold, right? <laughs> Sometimes you think you're coming in to feed the bird, right, with this, whatever the item is, and if you don't really know that bird, they can, they can snap up fast, right, to get, you know, to catch my fingers. That's why, one, I don't cross the bars with my fingers, because I can, I can see where those, that beak coming, <laughs> but those that I'm working with that everybody, I, I get this a lot. Oh, he's friendly. He's friendly. Not a problem. You can feed him. I don't. I always put it in the bowl. I just, I'm a different person. Your bird mint doesn't know me. I'm a different person. So when I'm training at home, I always put it in the bowl. Mm -hmm. um, but that I have, like I said, I have found, now Jay, who you saw in there, was a foster bird who um, came in. His original name was Jaws. And it fit him at the time. He he would be on the cage bars. Like if he could get through the bars, he he had a plan of <laughs> whatever his plan was. I was getting stitches if I had, and that was the, the first thing we worked on was targeting because I need because here's the thing I couldn't change his food bowl without you know him sitting on it looking at me going you know <laughs> I, you know. He and I had, were having, you know, so I would target, you know, we started doing target training and I would just get him to go to a perch that wasn't, wasn't near the food bowl, right? But I had a food bowl that was near that perch and I would just drop it in there and he, you know, we target train, he'd eat that. And while he was busy, then I could pull the food bowl out and do what I needed to do. It took a while. It wasn't like, oh, in a day. It, it took us, I think, a couple of weeks to do that. But then the good part was when he knew I was going to do the food bowl, he was already up on the perch. He was ready because we were very predictable. Um, so um, that's why I wanted to show you that all this training. So Jay and Jack, the same one who you saw, was same thing. All of them had these uncertainty behaviors. I don't want to put a label on it. They just they had certain things going on. And through target training, I was able to get some communication, get some behaviors. And great part is they all got adopted. They all ended up adopting, having a wonderful home. And the, I had to just pass that, my learning to those people. And so that's why I'm a big component of target training. And there's different, there are um, different approaches. I just, I'm big on shaping. That's just how I am. Have you ever had a bird that just wouldn't do it, no matter what you tried? Yeah. And sometimes they have, so for anybody, uh, and I, the one I had, even though we had no history of the bird, I am still suspicious, I'm going to put it that way, that the bird had history to the odd, to a stick, right? Because 
even when I was backed up five feet, right? You'd say five feet. Okay, that's how I got the door. The bird shouldn't even like pair, right? I'm five feet away. I would just move it, this stick, and the bird, again, would go back to not comfortable, you know, would just drop to the bottom of the cage, right? So, um, and so I started move, uh, you know, I tried smaller sticks, like, I mean, like, you know, all of you who know what millet looks like, I took all the millet off of this little stick, so it's like this little tiny, thinking, okay, we'll start at something, and I thought I had the momentum of that, but we, when I got closer to the cage, just that movement, right, he was four feet away, fine, three and a half, fine, we got to three feet, it's this little twig, <laughs> but there was enough, boom, the bird would just go to the Maybe, maybe somebody beat him with a stick. I don't know. And like I said, I kept trying to shape a different yeah. stick. Um, so I, we, I think, what did I move to? I ended up not, I just took the stick, I took the stick totally out. And um, sorry, bear with me. It was a couple of years ago. Um, what did we, I don't, we didn't use it. We didn't use a chip, a poker chip. Because uh, I did. Hey, he was going to eat it. <laughs> uh, I think we just bypassed it and went to just trying to see what we could, you know, what could we do with the bird? And I think we just went to stationing, meaning we just got the target stick all the way out and we just put bowls, a bowl next to a perch and we just worked at, I call it the stop and go game. Everybody has a different name for it, folks. I call it stop and go of approaching the cage and if the bird is again i'm defining my own calm you know where the bird isn't pacing it's not falling off the perch it's not buffing up. you know i don't mind a little sorry i'm going to do a cockatiel thing i don't mind a little like what are you doing you know um or a little what going i just don't want the whole you know whoa what do you you know i you know i want this nice so if i'm approaching a bird who again will go back to being that who's agitated on it. If I saw, I'll slow my pace down to like, it may take, you know, I'm doing one, 1,000, two, 1,000 foot down. One, one, you know, I'm really slowing down. And if the bird stays that, you know, is calm, I might just leave, right? The bird's calm, that's what I want. Perfect, I'll leave, I'll try the next time. And all I'm trying to do is get closer to the cage so I can put something in and have that calm behavior. Um, if the bird flares up while I'm approaching, I stop. I just stop. I stop. And when the bird finally kind of goes from, sorry, I'm using cockatoos because it's, or cockatoos because it's easier, you know, from, whoa, what are you doing to, oh, oh okay, uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. When I start to see it kind of, then I'll, I'll stop and then I'll leave because I don't want to leave when the bird's flared up. I want to leave when the bird is calmed down. So the bird, and I start to have this communication that, you know, it's a little, you know, it's a little different, but that's how, how we worked on it. And it gets you there. I, hmm. I think there's a different name for it, but that I call it stop and go. And then how long does it take to extinguish? Because you adopt out these birds and if the owner doesn't follow through and keep it going, um, do the birds revert back to previous? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had one. So, sorry, folks, to go down these stories, but yeah, um, I shouldn't say one. I've had two, but um, that's why I started getting a little tighter on it. So I, I had, I don't. For all of you who have green cheek kinders, I love you all, but you know, <laughs> uh, gee, I had a green cheek kinder who was very bitey. I, I, you know, I'm just going to say that. Um, and it, he would this kind great kinder, but just. You couldn't, you couldn't have him, you couldn't have him on you because he just would attack your skin. You ended up getting a whole bunch of hickeys on your neck or, you know, he just, you could not have him on you. Um, and so we did tar target training. He loved target training. He also loved that if you just left the target stick there, he could scratch himself. So he also loved that you just took the target stick, hang on, I got to use perfect bird here. And when you were done target sticking, you would just hold it and he'd come over with his little head and you go, Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. And he would just and he just thought that was fantastic, right? Like, so you didn't have to have your hands on him at all. He was just like, just do these things, and then when you're done, hold the target stick. I'll take care of this for myself. 
the adopter, I explained this all to my doctor, right? Because we were interviewing people. And this was through a rescue and they knew I had written down that, you know, this bird was sort of a hands off, but he was a cool bird, right? Like he'd hang out with you. He just, you couldn't have him on you. And he had learned that was fine, right? He was pretty perfectly fine of sitting here, right? He didn't want to be on you. He, he was perfectly fine with that. Um, and as long as you had the target stick, as you could tell, I still have it in my thing, right? <laughs> but you just hold it, keep like, oh, thanks. And, you know, on he goes. So I had this, we had this doctor, perfect doctor. We explained everything. We even showed her how to do it. And it was, he, we were able to transfer it, which is one of the things I teach. I transfer it. And the, the kinder was like, it was more like the kinder, sorry, back to the target stick with the blue stick, right? It was like, wherever the chopstick went, that's where he was, he's fine. I'm fine. I'm going with it. Um, and I get updates, you know, every couple of weeks. Oh, he's fine. He's fine. He's fine. Oh, he's biting me. Oh, he's biting me. Oh, you know, oh, he bit me again. And I'd be like, uh, you know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm thinking, oh, you know, but she was also like, oh, I wanted him to step up and, you know, would put her hand, you know, her hands in front of him. And then he just reverted right back. And so um, I don't really, I, he never came back to the rescue. I, I have a feeling the, the little bird, she she did care about this bird. I was just, I would just, so this is, uh, you know, but things happen. Um, so yes, they can revert back without it. I've, had, I've seen it within my own life and stuff. Um, so that's why consistency of target training is important, right? Of, you know, or any training we do. Right. And any of any training you do with your birds, and I know Amy knows this stuff. So I'm always like, see if you could do it in a different place. Do that same thing somewhere else. Do it someplace else. So there's always change. So the bird is always getting this change, but it's the same. But you're still teaching the same thing. You're just teaching it in different locations. Um, and this will help you so much in the future, you know, of this. Um, because if you ever move or anything changes in your house, in your house, right? If you haven't taught your bird to do these behaviors in different locations and different scenarios, when you go to change, change your furniture, the bird's going to be like, whoa, not happening. Yeah, that's actually a great idea to, if you're, if you're doing target training, take it to different parts of the house where the bird doesn't normally go. So, you know, then you're taking something they know, which is the target training, doing it in a different environment. So then they'll be calmer in this other environment because at least it's one thing that they, they're familiar with. So that, that, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, you just keep changing it. And there's nothing to say, if, again, depending on how you're, again, I've been to the vet, I get this, right? <laughs> you know, uh, bringing that target stick with you when you're at the vet and the bird has calmed down to do a little practice runs because you know you're going to hit these stressful moments. So if you can bring things back to, you know, oh, I know this game. Oh, now they may not take the food at that time. They may not because they're stressed, but they know, you know, you just ask. I always say, I always ask. I always, all my birds, I ask, do you, do you want to do this? Now, most of the time I get, no, I got to fix this feather because that vet screwed it up. But, you know, I still ask. Um, I, I can just see the pigeon. As long as she brings that red disc, she can probably take him yeah. anywhere. Yeah. And again, bed, like, I don't care. Where's where's the red disc? Oh, wait, it's on the scale? Okay, I'll step up on the scale. Where, and I'm going to tell everybody where that really came in handy was, again, she was dating a significant other. And this bird was attacking the significant other. And so what they did was they took this red chip and they passed it to him. And first he he would just do the same thing, throw it, you know, put it wherever, you know, but had to come to him, him for the food. And at first she said, you know, he, the pigeon would hit the, but go to her, but she didn't have the food. So he had to learn, oh, there's someone new change. And after that, he was able to, to you know, put the chip on his, on his hand like this and the bird would just fly and stop and they got him the bird now does not attack the person anymore can you imagine explaining this you start dating someone you're like okay before we go any further, further. I think about my pigeon and the red disc <laughs> <laughs> i tell you if they don't walk out the door then they're probably a keeper <laughs> yeah. 
And, you know, I probably these are lessons, you know, maybe this is another topic for some other time. But if any, most, I don't know if most, and I remember this in the beginning of my, I'm going to tell a story just because it's fun. Um, who my, my husband to be. But when I was dating, I had a bird who pretty much hated everybody I brought home. I mean, hated, right? Now, I didn't know all this stuff I know now, right? This was prior to all this stuff. And my husband, not at the time, who was dating, was sitting on the couch and the bird came over and he, I think he was eating a fortune cookie or something. And the bird came over and he's like, is, you know, he's, he's doing what I, I'm in the kitchen doing something. And he's like, is it okay if the bird has some food? And I'm like, why? He goes, because he's taking it from my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and he took the thing and he just wandered off. And I thought, well, that maybe that was a hint. He was a keeper. Um, but I tell people, uh, some of the people who I've worked with is we don't think about when we bring people into our homes, right? Most of the time our birds are in our cages or wherever, um, right? If, if you've ever brought a bird out when you've had somebody who doesn't come regular, I'm not talking about the bird, I'm talking about irregular people. The bird's kind of like, uh-uh, not having it. I don't know who this person is, gotta go, right? Where sometimes we should maybe have them in the cage and have the person do a little target training and do something so this bird gets used to different people approaching. You know, and again, safely, you can do all this stuff safely. Like that, Amy, like you were saying, they could just drop the, they don't cross the bars, just drop the food into the food bowl, you know, and don't cross. The, I always tell, do not put your fingers through the bars <laughs> unless you want to lose one of them, you know. Um, but that's why, again, this target train can be transferred to somebody else and help out, you know, during this. So that's why, and again, target training for any of you who give medicine, I'm a big, you can transfer that to the syringe. You just do the same, that's what I'm showing, but I skipped through it, the same exact process. And instead of us doing the whole rapid doing, you could just do target training, put the, whatever the stuff is in the syringe. You know, I, I start off with water or baby, baby, no iron juice in it. Um, at first so it's a little sweet. And then later on, I put a little tab of um, apple cider vinegar. So it's bitter. So that my birds understand that sometimes it's not sweet. <laughs> it's just a tap. It's just a little thing of it. So if you're target training with the syringe, you give them the medication and then follow up with a seed or whatever it is. You can, right? Yeah. Um, or you can, I've had people have two syringes. So they have one with the medicine and one with something yummy, sweet or water or something. So they can, you know, so the bird keeps opening their mouth. So it learns. So the bird who you saw that was doing the little roll. That's Tuke. Um, he's got some issues. So he is so syringe. He he is just programmed to to, to take medicine from syringes. Um, and so now it's really funny. And I should start videotaping. So I have his regular bowl of yummy juice, and I have the syringe of food of his medicine. He'll take that, but then he wants me to put the syringe and take the juice and give it to him that way. He doesn't want it from the bowl. So that's how you know he's like. Yeah. I'm like, okay, it's because at some point, again, back to you, I get to, I'm like, okay, we've done this four times. I'm done. I put the syringe away. You can drink from the bowl. I'm, <laughs> I'm out, you know? So it's just because I've reinforced it so many times and, I, you know, praised them and I give them. So that's why all of the training we do, it really is about, you know, we just giving them the choice, making sure we have whatever that, that, whatever they want, right? And I don't mean want like, you know, scratches, the yummy food, you know, the to whatever it is, as long as we withhold it a little bit, we can then get them to train for it. It's money. I don't know what, you know, um, I, people, this is my little office and my dog has left me right now, but she didn't like sitting in the office. She just, I don't know why, I have no idea. So I have kibble. Or that normally would have been in her bowl. I have it sit here and I just drop a few in, the, in on the this little bed next to me. And now it's really funny because now I uh, when I come home from work, she's sitting in the bed. Because she's <laughs> like, I'm waiting for my gibble. Because she knows, because I've reinforced that behavior so much that it's really funny. Um, same thing with my bird. So that all these steps that I'm giving you, 
it can be for anything, but that's why I like shaping, right? We just keep shaping our birds for something. Um, the only thing I got to warn, last thing I'll warn you on, I, I don't know, is some birds don't like changes at all. And so if you, if you add glasses to, to yourself, you change your hair color or your fingernail polish, your birds seem to like, don't know who you are all of a sudden, right? They just, all of a sudden it's like, I don't know who you are with those red fingernails, but you are not the same person I knew before. Because we haven't introduced them that by the way, our, our wonderful claws, our, you know, eagle thing can change colors. Right, these things can happen, you know, or people who get tattoos, they have to, so you almost have to go back to either if you're gonna if you are gonna drastically do your nails before you do it, like do one or two so the bird gets used to it before you, you go all out. Um same thing with hair color. Glasses are a little tougher. Um I I've had I have had to work with people who they got glasses and the birds are like, no, no, you know. <laughs> Um, and so I've had to have them go to CVS and buy readers, not that they want, so we can practice training so they're not ruining their beautiful $1,000 pair of glasses that they can go ruin a 999 one from CVS and we can practice so the bird gets used to the, the readers because it's changed, right? And this goes back to, um, Amy, I'm going back to with the target training, changing it, different things, same with us. If we change and we forgot to tell our birds, okay, they're like, I don't know who you are. So that, that's an important point because I know people that keep their birds on, <coughs> excuse me, very rigid schedules and everything has to be done at the exact same time in the exact same way. And they say, well, my bird doesn't like it. So they make it even more and more rigid when the reality is in the wild, birds never know from day to day, from minute to minute, hour to hour, what's gonna happen. Their, their world is constantly changing, much more than our world changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're not doing our birds any favors by putting, giving them this rigid schedule because then they freak out when there are any changes. You know, not to say that every day needs to be radically different, but if, you know, you wake them up at a different time, you feed them something different in a different location. If you keep constantly changing things up, I think birds end up much more resilient and much more like they are in, in the wild. And oh. you're able to handle changes because they're used to life being a constant change. Right. And that's exactly it. You know, if you have to, if everybody has to go up, that's fine. I enjoy this conversation because I don't, you know, um, it's I'm a very... Dawn's comment has been really great. Thanks a lot. But yeah. if, does anyone have any other questions? If you want to, you know, unmute yourself and just jump in, please do that or, yeah. or type in the chat. Yeah. Thank uh, you. We, we've been talking a lot, but I, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance. Yeah. And yeah. Each uh, made a little, um, a little uh, you know, uh, piece of wood for you as you were talking about. <laughs> so he, so, yeah, so he ate your piece of wood. He yeah, he, you know, he, he uh, does with his uh, beak. And uh, so he cut a piece of wood for you. All right. Now you, you were showing it. you were showing the uh, the, uh, you know, chopstick. So he made a chopstick. I like it. That's perfect. <laughs> and now you just put a little tape on it. Now you can target train with it. It's perfect. Yep. Good yeah. boy, Peach. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there. There. He's coming there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna take it from you and say, I will take care of that for you. I will make another toothpick for you. Hang right. on. <laughs> Speaking of blue and gold. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful, you know. And to all of you, I mean, it, it I'm gonna go back, Amy, to this with the rigidness. Um it does. And we we I, and I've had to work with people of the same thing of you know. Because we get up, right? We go to work. 7 a.m. I feed my birds. I come back. We do this, blah, blah, blah. And on, what happens on the weekend? I have the same problem. What happens on the weekend? I don't get up at 7 a.m. And I got two birds who are like, yo, woman, get up. Feed us. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> right? And, you know, I, I'm slowly adjusting, right, to say, well, I might feed you at this time. I might feed you at this time. I might, you know. They still have food and you know they have food and water it isn't like they don't you know it's the expectation right you come in and this is what we do and i get sorry i'm gonna have fun and when you come in we get kiki 
and this is what we do. Uh, uh, so with my birds, there is some a little bit of some unpredictability. Now I've gone back to work two days, so I work from home a couple of days and I work in the office a couple of days. And it took one of my birds a little bit of adjustment to that. Now, when I worked from home, I still treated it as I was working in the office. So I didn't interact with my birds. But I'm going to quote one of my, so I owe her five bucks every time I quote her. So Laura Joseph, if they can see you, smell you, hear you, they know you're there. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, so it was some thanks here from Cassie and Diane. Oh, uh, that's great. Cassie, oh, thank you. Gayla says, my bird gets emotional when I give her a spoon with about an eighth of a teaspoon of peanut butter, put an almond in her bowl. She wants to attack me in the spoon. If she does this, I don't give it to her right then. Any idea how target training would help? Yep. You would have so the spoon. So one of the questions I'd have is, is she attacking? Does she attack the spoon? Or is if you took the peanut butter and the almond away, is she attacking the spoon? Like, is it? What is her, why is she attacking the spoon, right? Like, it, it is the peanut butter or the almond. It's not the spoon. Okay. So she gets, she's getting over threshold because she's so excited about seeing the peanut butter. Yes, because I, I give her other things in a spoon like scrambled eggs or um, a different kind of smoothies mm -hmm. because I wanted her to be used to using a spoon so I can put medication. Okay. So she's not, it's not the spoon. It's the peanut, it's a little bit of the peanut butter or it's the almond. It's an emotional response. Mm. Uh, if you, if you separated them. So if, if you had just peanut butter and no almond, right? I'm just curious. I, I, I'm no, no, it's, just, if, it's just one, one or the other. Those are the two things that set her off. Okay. Boy, she just Is it too off. thick for her? Pardon me? Is it too thick for her? No, it's not that. It's just she's ex emotional about getting it. And then she does. She wants to be able to pick up the spoon on her own and eat it. She doesn't even want you to hold it for her. Uh, it's, real emo it's like, I'll get it when I want it. It's just, it's a weird thing. Other yeah, stuff she'll take from a spoon, no problem. Because I was thinking with the spoon and the peanut butter, one, it's thick onto the spoon. So I could see her wanting to grab the spoon spoon to, to hold it right I'm guessing hold it to to do it because most of the other items like if you put an almond just using the example an almond on a spoon I would think their beak should be able to pick it up right off the spoon peanut butter to me is very thick at least the peanut butter I buy is thick right? <laughs> uh, I don't know but no, she she eats other things holding a well holding a spoon it's just the emotional of me putting it there and she like wants to attack me or the spoon or the almond while, while I'm putting it in. It's those items are an emotional response. Maybe she doesn't like them. No, she she will then eat them later. Yeah, she'll her. eat them later. Right, she'll eat them later. So my, my, my one answer would be don't put them on a spoon, right? And see if you put them on some other, put them on a cracker, you know, to... Because I don't want, I, so to me, I'm more worried about the attacking, right? This Right, it's the attack thing. Why right. is it emotional? It's emotionally getting her wound up. That, right. So that's why I'd say if we took the spoon away and put the peanut butter on a, some other portable object, <laughs> that's why I was thinking a cracker, um, and <laughs> putting putting it in the bowl. So I, I only reason I'm saying take, I know you're using the spoon for medicine. But I don't, if we're using it for medicine, you'd want that nice calm behavior, which you're getting with every other, sounds like every other thing. So I would just not put the peanut butter and the almond on the spoon and use that for. Okay, well, the almond, I'm not putting the spoon. I just put it in the bowl and she like attacks. I did try putting the peanut butter on a banana chip the other day and it was the same kind of response. <laughs> so you think that she's just, She's so excited and overwhelmed. Over threat. Yeah, she sounds like she gets she's just she, she's like, like, a, a, like a two year old and just doesn't know what to do with all that energy. And yeah, threshold. Yeah, well, she's an Amazon for one thing. Yeah. So I can't do Amazon looks. I can only do cockatiels and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> so maybe it's this. Um, I again, target training. 
what I would in that instance, if we're going to let's talk about target training, is use that as the last item, right? So when you're target training, use some calmer items to put in the bowl, right? And get her, to, but move her away from the bowl, right? So have her perch that's a little bit further away from the bowl, have her touch the target, and then but put the items in the bowl. When you're getting to that last, so you get her to touch, you know, sorry, come here, perfect bird. So perfect bird. So she's on a perch, not near the bowl. She touches, right? And then put the item in the, even if it's, I would put it a, a little banana piece on uh, and peanut butter on the, in the bowl. But let's get her focus on the target stick. So her focus is here. Don't show her the, like, when she does it, you just go over and drop it in the bowl. But it, so random items, right? It, maybe this time it's the banana with the peanut butter. Maybe it's an almond. It's a random item that goes in the bowl. So what we could try to do is keep her under threshold. So that, because I, I, I agree with what Amy said, something about, and it could, like you said, you're using emotional, I'm just saying threshold. Um, is just getting her hyped up. So if we could figure a way to calm her down, I would just random, you know, have her train and what alternate items. She just doesn't see it. You just pop them in. So she doesn't see it. Because she's over on the, she's stationing somewhere else. But we can look at other objects. You're always welcome to reach out to me or Amy. Okay. Well, it, it's not a big deal. I just was trying to tie it into how yeah. I could utilize target yeah. tree. I would, I would that's a great idea. There's certain things that just kind of set them off, and that's yeah. those are the two things that I I face. Hello, Janet. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? I've been sick. That's why I'm like on this. That's fine. I'm, that's why I'm not uh, being visual today. I don't feel that's, it. That's okay. I don't mean to keep everybody up late either. I didn't. I'm sorry. I I just wanted to show target training. I'm very excited about it. It's my you know, a little bit of my passion. I love doing it. Um, well, I'm in California, so it's 5.30. I'm good. Oh, okay. well, she's going to have dinner soon, you know. Uh, All right, do we have any other questions or comments before we wrap it up? Okay. One thing you mentioned about other people, when I first got my parrot, you know, I met her when she was a baby. I waited for her to hatch out of an egg. Is the woman who was hand feeding her said, hand her off to different people. And um, and not just one person. You know, my uh, my husband and I would sit on the uh, towel and we like, you know, hand her off and stuff. So she will go to other people if she psychs them out and thinks they're cool people. <laughs> if they're if they've had a bird before, they're animal people or they're artists. She will go to them. Artists, I like that. That, that yeah, way. she psychs them out. She's good. <laughs> but and there uh, is there, and there is something about that social, you know, part. As long as it's not scary, right? As long as there's always something good about it, right? You know, that happens. Amy, right, you have a great bird, you know, like you bring everywhere. And that bird, yeah. Right. yeah. That's so, why I bring my bird everywhere. Yeah. Um, my, Rose my, would go to anyone. If she, I had some, I don't know, repair person or someone over recently who she didn't take to. And that, I have to say it, it had me worried. It had me worried. You should. Because, Hear these stories of the dog who loves everybody and then doesn't like someone and they turn out to be a murderer or something. Exactly. No, I get a new repair person. <laughs> I'm serious. No, I know. It was just it was, tell. I think you know why I think because he walked in the house and he just made a beeline for her and just started rubbing her head. He like he didn't introduce himself. And you know, she loves having strangers rub her head, but he was he was so forward and he didn't have birds at home, so it was the strangest thing to walk up to a bird when you've had no bird experience and just not even be afraid you may get bitten or, you know, <laughs> just walk up and start rubbing their head. And uh, so I think she was like, whoa, dude, who who are you? Yeah, back up. Well, that's why I like having signals and stuff. So the bird has a choice. Um, I just, for your, for both of you, again, it's a laugh. Um, again, the, the little orchid I have. Because everybody in my house is over five feet tall, when we have our holiday party, any, it's funny because there are people under, you'll know where I'm going, anybody who's under five feet, usually are younger people, um, aren't allowed to go upstairs because, you know, my birds are up there. And um, But I know when they go up there, they sneak up because my lorikeet will tell everybody because he 
He does not understand who, the, why, why are people, their people are supposed to be this tall. Why are, who are these little wobbly things that are coming into this area? So it's very funny that, that, you know, this is what I was talking about, how you, these little changes, you think it's kids. So what, uh, my bird has never seen kids. And so that, that, that height, and it's, it's about five feet, right? That height just throws her, throws him right off the wall. Mm. Nope, nope, not happening. Not happening. So well, my bird judges people on their character, <laughs> which is a very good thing. That's a good thing. My, sorry, it doesn't my... matter what size they are, ethnicity, their religion, political faction, doesn't matter. It's their character. I, then you have a really good bird. I mine's, do. Mine's sad. He faces everything on height. <laughs> she one time all wanted to go on a one and a half year old baby. She loved this kid that she'd see at the park. Of course, I didn't let her, but later on, she still saw the child. She connected with this one person. Hmm. She's very cool. It's great. All right. I think it's getting time to wrap it up. Any last comments, questions from anybody? Thank you, Sheila. That was a very good presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Because I, I, I don't use target training, and I don't quite understand the reason why, because she's kind of responsive, but I'm going to think about this. Yeah. And it, like I said, if anybody's not sure, I, like I said, I have this. What I showed you is the small, you know, I have every freaking, you know, step, move, stop, don't go. You know, I wrote it up in every little step because um, target training is it, not as, as I tell people, as simple as it appears to be. And every bird's different. And every reinforcing is different. And every, so you, you have to sort of, that's why when I was showing behavior of them, if I see any movement, I stop. It's like, up, oh, okay, not, you know, you have to do that. So, but I appreciate all, everybody's time for coming. Well, that's because you respect the animals, respect the birds. Yeah. Well, this and is that's a life. lesson that I teach children when I run into them. You have to respect the bird. And this is why I have all my fingers. Yes. <laughs> I can, uh, anyone who's interested, just contact me. I can give you Sheila's uh, yeah. website, her information. She does do uh, behavioral training with people. She she does it over Zoom now, right, Sheila? Yep. Oh, yeah. Most, yeah oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah, I do it over Zoom. Um, and that's why a lot of, that's why you got to see that wonderful pigeon thing. I, luckily, like I said, my client lets me share that because she, she, we're okay. both that we're so thrilled about that one. That was again. Have, have you done Have you done it with crows? I don't know anybody with a pet crow. <laughs> I did do it for a little while with roosters and chickens. I was doing mat mat racing. I was using a mat as a target and having them race. I have to say the pigeon thing was my favorite. <laughs> that was great. I just love the pigeon. So uh, yeah. This is you know, if you if you want to contact her one on one, if you with some problems, uh, yeah, you know, or just say hi. Don't worry. Uh, you know, and thanks again, Sheila, for another fabulous presentation. This this was wonderful, as as always. And Sheila, um, you look you look great. You really look good. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I like all of you.